As the piston lowers on the induction stroke, the crankshaft is of course turning and that turns the camshaft. As the camshaft turns, that pushes up the cam followers. The cam followers push up on the push rod and the push rod pushes up on the back of the rocker arm. Because the rocker arm is a pivot, pushing up at the back makes it push down at the front. And that compresses the valve spring. This downward pressure from the rocker arm opens the inlet valve. And so the suction pressure created by the downward movement of the piston in perfect timing of the opening of the inlet valve means that the engine can now draw in air through the carburetor, picking up fuel and taking it into the cylinder as air fuel mix. So the raised position on the cam, activating the cam follower and pivoting the rocker arm along with the piston position means that the engine can draw in its fuel. But of course, this is all just a snapshot of a moment in time for the engine. So the engine continues to turn and that moves away the raised point of the cam, allowing the cam follower to settle on the lower part of the cam. And it will stay that way for almost a full revolution. This allows the push rod to lower, which allows the back of the rocker arm to lower. And thus the valve spring at the front is allowed to raise again. This closes the inlet valve. And so as the engine continues to cycle, there's almost a full revolution of the downward position on the cam that operates the inlet valve, where the cam follower sits in its low position, thus ensuring that the inlet valve is closed. And at the same time, there's almost half of a revolution on the second cam at the back, at the low point, making sure that the exhaust valve is closed. So that means that both of the cam followers are in their low positions throughout the turning distance of the crankshaft, allowing the piston to rise with both valves closed on the compression stroke to compress the air and fuel for combustion. Now combustion has occurred and the piston's been forced back down in the power stroke. That comes in time with the turning distance of the crankshaft the high point of the cam at the back that opens the exhaust valve pushes the cam follower upwards. And because the exhaust rocker arm is now pushed up at the back, it pushes down on the exhaust valve spring, thus opening the exhaust valve and the rising of the piston pushes out all of those exhaust gases through the exhaust valve and out through the exhaust. And of course the cycle just continues. And so they are the four strokes and that's of course why this is called a four stroke engine or a four cycle engine. So you can see that for the right strokes to occur, the valves have to be timed perfectly to allow the engine to run. Those cams would have to be in just the right place to allow for the movement of the cam followers to operate the valves perfectly for the correct positioning of the piston. And a vital part of that is making sure that the crankshaft is perfectly timed with the camshaft. And generally, as you can see there, there are two points that meet. So that's perfectly timed. But what has that all got to do with setting the valve clearances or setting the tappets as some refer to it? In fact, what does valve clearances mean? Well, let's take a look at the front of each rocker arm. When the piston is at its uppermost point or top dead center on the compression stroke, here where the rocker arm meets the top of the valve on each, there should be a certain clearance or gap between the two. That's because if there is a clearance on each of these, when the piston is at top dead center on the compression stroke, then it means that neither of them are putting a slight push on any of the valves, which we don't want. Because if we had any of these valves open on the compression stroke, when we're supposed to be compressing the air and fuel for combustion, then of course combustion just wouldn't take place because we'd be losing that vital pressure. So making sure we have a gap will make sure that these valves are closed in this position.
but we can't just settle for any old gap. The gaps on these are way too much. So let's have a look at how incorrect gaps can affect the running of the engine. Excessive valve clearance gaps like this can cause what's known as valve clatter. That loud ticking and tapping noise as the engine runs because the tappets are clattering the top like this because of the distance. And you can imagine this kind of operation would create excessive wear for the tappets and the top of the valve stems possibly and potentially components such as the push rods because we've got too much gap and slap there allowing these components to move up and down excessively. This can all have a knock-on effect right down the system to the two cams and the cam followers. Now I've overemphasized the gap on this to make a point. The likelihood is you'd never see a gap of this sort of distance. But you can imagine that when the engine turns and the piston lowers for the induction stroke, it's going to take slightly longer for the valve to open because the tappet has to close that distance first before it can apply pressure to open the valve. Worse still is that it won't push the valve down far enough. It will start to come back up too soon because the end of the tappet is generally too far up so it won't go low enough because of that oversized gap. So you can see that before the piston has even finished its induction stroke, the inlet valve closed again and when it did open there was only a very small gap there which will put a major restriction on all of that air and fuel that needs to come into the cylinder. Okay so now let's have a look at what happens when there's too much distance on the exhaust valve tappet. So let's imagine combustion has just taken place and this is the power stroke, the piston has been forced down and inside here is exhaust gases, the piston keeps travelling down and when the piston gets to about this point the exhaust valve should start to open before the piston travels to its lowest point. And you can see that with the exhaust cam at the back. The highest point of the cam is starting to push the cam follower before the piston has lowered. That should of course start to compress the valve spring and start to open the exhaust valve. But as with the inlet tappet, when there's too much gap here on the exhaust tappet, it has to close that gap first before it can even push down on the valve spring to open the valve. And because usually as the piston gets to the bottom of the power stroke like that, the exhaust valve starts to open then to allow air to come in through the exhaust valve into the cylinder, thus creating a swirl of air and exhaust gas mix inside of here, ready to be pushed out of the exhaust valve. And at the same time, the opening of the exhaust valve as the piston is still lowering ensures that there's no buildup of suction pressure inside here, preventing the piston from going down efficiently. But if there's too much gap on the tappet, then the piston can be traveling down and the exhaust valve can open too late. And a suction pressure can possibly build up inside of here preventing the best possible movement efficiency possible for the piston in its downward travel. And also when it does open, it's likely that it won't open at its maximum, therefore making it more difficult for the piston to push the gases out through the exhaust. This again can possibly cause a drag for the piston. Of course, mentioning all of this about the valves and tappets may indeed only cause a slight issue for the engine, but we want the engine to run as efficiently as possible, so we don't want any problems if we can help it. So making sure the valve clearances are set correctly is a must. Okay, so now we've seen what happens when there's too much gap there, let's now have a look what happens when there's too little gap. Well, in extreme cases where the tappet is pushing down on the valve spring, because it's adjusted way too low, means that the valves may well not be seating correctly onto their seats. There may be a slight gap there. And this, of course, can reduce engine compression and reduce the efficiency of the engine. At the same time, if there's constant leakage through an incorrectly seated valve over time, this can cause damage to the seat, a condition known as valve seat recession. So if we do have a situation of valve seat recession here, 
then as I've said, that can cause reduced compression, decreased engine performance and potential valve damage over time. And because the valves may not be closing fully, this can allow hot gases to pass through them much more often and more readily. This increases the temperatures of the valve seats and accumulation of hot gases in the chamber just behind the valves, potentially causing overheating, valve burning and premature wear. So valve seat leakage can cause poor fuel combustion, increased emissions and potential misfiring. And the maintenance of any engine should include regular checks of the valve clearances to make sure they are at the right distances. This, of course, is if you want to maintain the best engine performance and dependability. But what we have to remember is that different makes and models of engine will have different valve clearance settings. So it's always best to take a look at your manufacturer specifications on your engine's manual for the correct clearances. If not, then a quick Google search with your make and model of engine may well bring up the correct valve clearances for your particular engine. Okay, so it's much easier to adjust an engine like this, which of course is cut out because we can see where the components are. But if we're going to adjust any valve clearances on any engine, one of the first things we must do is make sure that the engine of course is turned off and the spark plug wire is removed from the spark plug because we don't want any accidental starting of the engine during the procedure. And the next thing I would do is locate the valve cover. This one, of course, has been removed so that we can see all the components. But once you've located the valve cover, remove the valve cover, this will expose the tappets and the valve springs. The next thing I would do is to identify which one of these tappets operates the exhaust valve and which one operates the inlet valve. And the way I would do that on this particular engine is, if we can see we've got the exhaust here, and we could imagine that we've got the exhaust port coming this way, and it goes to this valve here. We can see that. So I would say that this is the exhaust rocker arm. And if we look here, we've got the carburetor. If we follow that through, we've got this here, which looks like the inlet tube and that's closest to this valve. So this would be the tappet or the rocker arm for the inlet. But of course, all engines are different and I can only go by the one I've got in front of me. So if you take a good look at your cylinder head and all of these ports coming in and out, you can generally make a good assumption as to which is which. Okay, so now we know this is the exhaust and this is the inlet. What we need to do is have the piston at top dead center, its uppermost point, on the compression stroke because if it's on the compression stroke then both valves should be completely closed to keep in the combustion pressure so with the valves being totally closed in there we can look at setting the right gap for the tappets so how do we make sure that the piston is at top dead center on the power stroke of course on this cutout we can see that the piston is at top dead center but how do we know it's on the power stroke? Well, what I would personally do is remove the spark plug completely. And that will now allow us to look down into the plug hole to see if we can see the top of the piston and it will remove the compression to allow us to turn over the engine freely, which is what we need to do. So to make it simple, I just turn the flywheel until I can see the inlet rocker arm move. So there. Now the inlet rocker arm has gone down at the front. I know I'm now on the induction stroke because the inlet valve is now open. So I keep going until this now comes up. So I now know that the inlet valve now is closed and I now know that the next stroke is the compression stroke. So I keep turning and at the same time, I look down in through the spark plug hole to see if I can see the top of the piston rising towards me. And if that's the case, all well and good. 
I just watch the piston rise to its highest point and then stop. If I've gone too far, I just come back a little. And now I know that the piston is at top dead center on the compression stroke, exactly where I want it to be. But however, I am aware that you can't always see down the spark plug hole to see the top of the piston. So in this situation, I use something long and thin enough to very gently place down in through the spark plug hole and rest on top of the piston, making sure no damage is occurring. This is an old punch I sometimes use. And so I loosely hold this here and turn the flywheel more so that the piston raises and also raises the punch with it. And I wait until the punch doesn't raise any more and it starts to go down. Then I come back with the flywheel and just get it so that the punch is at its highest point. Then I know that the piston is at top dead center. Now we're in a position to set these tappets. Okay, so everything is in the right position to make the settings. Now we take a set of feeler gauges and use the appropriate size as specified by the engine's manufacturer. Sometimes the clearances for the exhaust and the inlet, sometimes they're slightly different from each other. So we slide in the appropriate sized feeler gauge between the front of the rocker arm and the valve stem and we make sure that there's a gap there. With this one, I can feel that there's too much gap because what you want it to do is feel like it's very slight pinch on there when you move it. So with this one, I'm just going to adjust the top, just turn it until there. That there, there's just a very slight pinch and you can hear it as it goes in and out, just very slightly. That one's now set. Now to this one, you can see there's too much gap there again. So we'll just screw it in to tighten it slightly. And with that one, that's now absolutely fine as well. It's just pinching slightly. I can feel both the upper and lower parts just very slightly biting on those feeler gauges, but it's still free. Okay, so that's the tappet set. The actual adjusting the tappets is probably the easier part. The more tricky part is getting everything in the right position in order to set those tappets. Okay, so I hope I've given you enough information there as to why we set the tappets and the understanding around it. Hopefully I haven't given you too much information. And if you think this video is worthy of a thumbs up, then please do give me one. It helps me get my content out there further to a larger audience and it really helps me out. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing and I'll be back soon. Thank you for watching.